Welcome everybody in this week's uh, quantum information and quantum computing seminar. Uh, we have a pleasure to uh, to host Chris, uh, Christian uh, Beltoni, who is a PhD student in Free University of Berlin. So he he, he does uh, he, he's a member of the Insights group, and be and he'll be telling us about his recent work on low depth classical shadows based on low low depth uh, random quantum uh, low depth Clifford circuits. Please, the, the screen is yours. It's great to have you, uh, Christian. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the interaction. Yeah, I'm Christian. Hello. And uh, yes, I will be talking a little bit about this, this Shallow Shadows paper. This uh, was joint work with, with a crowd of people. So there was me, but there was also Jonas Hafferkamp, then Marcel and Magios, with our, who are there with you, uh, Jens Isaac, of course, and Hako Pashayan. So, Essentially, this, this uh, shallow shadows protocol that I'm going to be talk up, talking about is a variation on this uh, famous now uh, classical shadows by Juan Kuhn and Preskill. And <clears throat> I will spend the first 10 minutes or so just summarizing this classical shadows protocol uh, for those that might not be familiar with it. So at its heart, this protocol given an unknown state row, which is a state on n qubits, allows you to estimate uh, the expectation value of some observable O. And really the, the beauty of the protocol is that it, is that it allows you to estimate the expectation value of many observables. But uh, for simplicity, I'm going to restrict the discussion to one observable because the, the, the elements are all there. And how it works, it works like you draw some unitary U from some ensemble of unitaries, curly U, and you use it to evolve the state. This ensemble of unitaries uh, will end up being uh, in, in the HKP case, an ensemble of Clifford unitaries. But uh, in general, you can draw a unitary for, from any ensemble and you use it to evolve the state. And then you perform a measurement in the computational basis. And you finally, given this post measurement state that you get with some probability, you apply the inverse unitary. Uh, and this on, uh, this is a random process, of course. It depends on the randomness in the choice of random unitary and in the choice uh, uh, and in the measurement result. And on average, you get this state. This, this, there. Is, can you see my 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 cursor, by the way? Yeah. Okay. So here is the probability of getting a certain measurement result, and and you have the average or the unitaries. And this uh, and this evolution happens to be a quantum channel, a CPTP map which we would call the measurement channel from now on. And if the if these ensemble curly U satisfies some property, uh, it, ter it turns out to be invertible as a linear map. And we can define what HKP call a classical snapshot of rho as this rho hat, which is just the inverse measurement channel applied to this, uh, to this U dagger B. And why would we do this? Because this rho hat is a random variable, which on average, exactly reproduces the state row. And uh, since, as it will turn out in HKP, that this unitary that world Clifford's, these classical shadows can be stored completely classically. And so we can uh, <clears throat> we can use these classical shadows to construct a, a random variable that can be stored on our classical computer. And this random variable O uh, averages to the real expectation value of uh of the observable o so the procedure works like this given some n classical snapshots and the collection of classical snapshots is called the classical shadow we can compute the average the empirical average of this uh random variable o hat and we get an estimate for uh for the expectation value of our observable which converges to the real value for n to infinity and the the, the nice thing is that the classical shadows the classical shadow itself is completely independent of the observable. So once we have collected the classical shadow, we can estimate any observable that we want completely classically. Uh, we don't need to do anything quantum anymore. But uh, of course, this is nice. Uh, but um, we don't really want to take an infinite number of samples. Uh, what we would like ideally is that this estimate converges quickly. To the to the actual expectation value, and of course this is controlled by the variance of this random variable 
OHAT. And I mean, you can use all sorts of, uh, of classical concentration bound, but the, the, basic, uh, the basic fact is that if you want an expected error of epsilon in your estimate, you need the number of samples that scales like the variance of your random variable over epsilon squared. And so we are interested in this variance being small. In, in the HKB protocol, the variance is bounded by this strange quantity, uh, this, uh, this uh, shadow norm, and which is this, this big expression. But what it just, this expression is, oops, inside the maximization, this is just the variance of the random variable O hat. But this, of course, depends on the state uh, that, that we're trying to, to, to characterize. And so to get a worst case scenario, we maximize over all possible states. And this shadow norm essentially tells you how how many samples you have to take in order to get arbitrary precision in your in your estimate. So in total, there are a few prerequisites that that the that the whole thing must satisfy in order to be able to run this HKP protocol. On the very basic level, you need to be able to sample from the ensemble U curly U. And you need to be able to evolve states using unitaries from the ensemble, which is the only quantum part of the process. And so in a sense, it's also the most challenging part. Then on a classical level, you need to be able to compute and store the classical snapshots efficiently. Because if you have to store a two to the n times two to the n uh, unitary, then, then there is no much point in, uh, in doing this. And finally, you need to be able to compute the, the, this random variable efficiently. And this is about the actual practical efficiency of the protocol, but we also need to consider the, the sample efficiency. So the shadow norm of the observables that we are interested in should be polynomially bounded in the system size. Um, and all of this, all of these conditions, essentially, they all hinge upon the choice of unitary ensemble, which is uh, what is going to matter a lot in the end. So uh, <clears throat> first possibility that uh, HKP give is this global Clifford scheme. So here the choice of ensemble is the uniform distribution on the n qubits Clifford group. So we take our n qubits and we apply a huge global n qubits Clifford picked at random from the uniform distribution. And uh, as far as uh, efficiency, practical efficiency goes, uh, this is practical because the measurement channel is very easy to invert. The measurement channel is a simple depolarizing channel. And this U dagger B, which are the ro inverse rotated post measurement states, are stabilizer states. And so uh, we can store them efficiently and we can do computation computations with them efficiently. And for the sample uh, efficiency, we have that the shadow norm of any observable scales with the Frobenius norm of the observable. In, in, in particular, this means that this is very, very good for low Frobenius norm observables. And in, and in particular, you get a cost, constant sample complexity to estimate fidelities because state projectors have Frobenius norm one. But it's really bad for high Frobenius norm observables because this is, for example, local operators and uh, which, which have uh, an exponentially large Frobenius norm in the system size. And as a disadvantage of this, it's pretty hard to evolve states with unitaries from the ensemble because you need on your quantum device to be able to apply global Clifford gates. And, and this is quite hard. And if you only have, I mean, I think depending on the implementation, the best you can do is n squared over log n entangling gates to, to, to apply a, a global Clifford. And even more if you don't have all to all interaction. Uh, an alternative is the local Clifford scheme, where instead we draw n individual one qubit Cliffords and we apply them uh, individually to each qubit. This has the same advantages as before. Everything is a stabilizer state. The measurement channel is easy to invert. Uh, and of course, it's good at estimating different observables. In particular, uh, the, the, the shadow norm is exponentially large in the, in the locality of a K local observable. So this is very good at estimating local observables, but bad at estimating global ones. But the advantage is that it's much, much easier to uh, implement in practice because you only need to be able to apply one qubit gates. So uh, the point of this shallow shadows uh, 
protocol is to introduce an ensemble, which is an, an, a bridge, an intermediate between these two extremes. And uh, obviously this is uh, given by uh, circuits, by Clifford circuits of a certain depth. And I will introduce this and then I will explain how we can satisfy all of the requirements that I talked about earlier. So how we can uh, store efficiently the classical shadows. And to do this, we will need to characterize the measurement channel and find a way to, to apply the inverse of the measurement channel to the states that we care about, which is a really, very uh, simple procedure in the, in the two extreme case, but turns out to be quite complicated in the, in the intermediate case. And finally, for the sample complexity, I will try to provide evidence that, that uh, this protocol is a sort of sweet spot in the middle, uh, which is easier to implement than the global Cliffords, but it has essentially the same performance while still maintaining the ability to estimate local observables. So, as I said, uh, and, and by the way, feel free to, to interrupt me if you, if you want to ask questions or, or anything like that. Um, so, as I said, this intermediate ensemble is given by a depth D pre quark Clifford circuits, where we draw just a bunch of two qubit Cliffords from the uniform distribution and we arrange them in this pre quark architecture. This is this, uh, this idea of an intermediate circuit for classical shadows already appeared earlier in a paper by Hu, uh, Choi, and Yu. And, uh, also in a paper by Akhtar, who I knew, which was actually developed in parallel with ours. But uh, anyway, uh, the, the, this is an intermediate in the sense that there is, we included this D equals zero layer, which doesn't actually change the ensemble because the averages over this single cubic Clifford's can just be absorbed in the average of these big ones. But it's conceptually useful because it means that the D equals zero case uh, corresponds to the local Clifford scheme of HKP. And if we push the depth really high to something that scales linearly in the system size, we recover the three design property. And so we recover the, the, the global Clifford's uh, scheme. And from now on, uh, we will assume that the depth scales uh, logarithmically in the system size. This, which provides a, a, a clear advantage over the global Clifford's and which and this is the regime in which the whole protocol will be efficient. So uh, before I go on, there is a very small change in terminology that I included because I don't want to be too confusing. In the in the HKP protocol, the classical snapshots are these, this m minus one of u dagger v, and we compute the average of this random variable here. But in our case, applying this m minus one will be a, a hard, a computationally expensive process. And so we don't, if we have many, many shadows, we don't really, if, well, in the case we have more shadows than observables, we don't really want to apply the M minus one to each uh, U dagger B. And there are cases in which this will not even be necessary. So we would like to delay this M minus one application as far as possible. Instead, we will collect and store the classical snapshots U dagger B U and apply the M minus one channel to the observable. And this changes nothing because this M is a self-adjoint operator. But just to say that from now on, when I say classical snapshot, I refer to the post-measurement state rotated with the inverse unitary that we drew right front. So the first requirement was that we must be able to store this, this, this classical snapshots. And in this case, we can, since there are- uh, uh, Sir Kishan, yeah. can you move back to the previous slide? Sure. Uh, so uh, just uh, don't you need uh, ah that's a question so so this okay maybe you mentioned that I missed it so so this M is it uh, self adjoint in the uh, sort of a super operator mm -hmm. it yes, is it ah so that's why you can just sure okay yeah yeah um, exactly that's... sorry yes uh, sorry, I I this, sorry okay. Yeah, M is self-adjoint in the in the Hilbert Schmidt inner product, and mm -hmm. so and so we can just shift it around this way. Yep. So we can store this U dagger B efficiently because they're just the outputs uh, of a shallow circuit, and so we can represent them as a matrix product state. Uh, and this matrix product state, each time we add a layer, the matrix the the bond dimension doubles, and 
So this MPS will have a one dimension of two to the D minus one. And since we're assuming D to scale logarithmically in the system size, this will be polynomially bounded. And here I want to stress that these unitaries do not strictly need to be Clifford operators. You can, in principle, also sample from, for, from, the, full Clifford, from the full unitary group on, on two qubits, uh, just to say that this does not rely on, on stabilizers uh, anymore, but on, on the MPS representation. Um, so okay. question. So, uh, yeah. like, okay, like I'm, I'm actually I'm familiar with MPS, but can you comment a bit, uh, like, to people that not everybody maybe is familiar with MPS formalism? Mm -hmm. uh, what, like, on high level, what, uh, what? I mean, it's a well-known technique, but maybe you can elaborate a bit why, if you have shallow circuits, you can efficiently sort of uh, <laughs> compute everything if you start from project state. Yes, of course. Okay, uh, then, uh, so in case anybody is not familiar with, with what an MPS is, it's simply th this notation, each box, each box is, uh, is a matrix and the open legs are the open indices of the matrix. And so in an MPS, we can represent a, a vector with, on, let's say on n qubit with n indices uh, by only storing a few indices at the times in these smaller matrices which means that we can have many, many uh, fewer coefficients instead of a, a big box, right? And if we have a shallow circuit, um, it's, the, the, all of these boxes are unitaries and we can, if we contract all of these legs, so we sum over all of these legs from these three boxes, we get this one box. And these legs that are crossed by the green line, they remain open. And, and they form this leg here, this leg up here. And so from this, uh, well, this D boxes here, we get this one box here and the output is the, is these two open legs here. And the bond dimension is the size of this indices, index here. And of course, the higher the bond dimension, the more memory you need to store this, this element. And since each of this leg, this is, these are, Four by four matrices. These are two qubits unitaries. Each of these legs uh, is an index that can be zero or one. It has two values. Each time we add one, so each of these legs contains two indices, and so in total the size of this index will be uh, two to the d minus one. And so uh, we are interested in this bond dimension being polynomial in the system size, and a circuit with that depth which is logarithmic in the system size will have a bond dimension, which is polynomial in the system size. And so we can store efficiently this, 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 uh, this vector. Otherwise, we would need to store each matrix element individually. And this requires an exponential amount of memory. Uh, and perhaps time to, to do the contraction. Sorry? Oh, it's time. Maybe time to do the contraction. Yes, that's, that's true. We need also time to do the contraction. Yeah. Um, yeah, many, many thanks for, for yeah for pedagogical interview. No, no, and I, I mean I, I don't I'm I'm never sure like uh, how much time should I spend because I'm worried about boring people. So please tell me also if I bore you, <laughs> as well as if I skip stuff. So, so I hope can I ask? So so you need this bond because in the title of your paper you have uh, of your talk you have Clifford circuits, right? Uh, so so sort of uh, uh, like if you had Clifford circuits, you could evolve quite efficiently without referring to bonds. I mean, you can evolve even for larger depths, right? Uh, on a classical computer, right? Yeah, you don't need uh, bond uh, sort of MPSs at all, right? For, for Cliffords. So uh, that's right, yeah. Uh, so, okay, so, so, so is part of your scheme gonna be not, would be more general than Clifford's and that's why you, uh, you talk about MPSs now or just, uh, okay, maybe. Yeah, so know. the problem is that part of the scheme will be uh, dependent on this MPS representation, namely the uh, representation of the measurement channel uh, is, okay. is, gonna, is gonna be dependent on MPS rather than, than, than Clifford's. Okay. Maybe uh, maybe there is a way to do it for for stabilizers as well. We haven't really thought about it, but uh, I cannot imagine it right now. Sure, thanks. So as I was saying, once we have stored the the um, the classical snapshots, we need to apply this m inverse channel to them or to the observable. 
And for this, we need to know what this measurement channel is in the first place. And uh, this is a uh, is a very simple thing in the in the two extreme case, d equals zero and uh, global Cliffords, because these two uh, the, the sets uh, from which the unitaries come from is a group in this sense, and there is a lot of structure, a lot of symmetry, and it ends up being a simple depolarizing channel. Unfortunately, in this uh, in this case, in the general D setting, the ensemble uh, the set is not a group, but we do not lose all structure. Namely, there is still the group structure in the in the local two qubit Cliffords, and uh, so this allows allows you well a more general even even a more uh, general property called Pauli invariance, so that the ensemble is invariant under multiplication on the left and right by Pauli operators. Uh, this allows to prove that the channel is diagonal in the Pauli basis, and this was already noticed by by Co Garcia and by Buco Garcia and Jaffe. Uh, so if we apply this measurement channel to any Pauli, we will just get an eigenvalue back and times the Pauli. And this is a very general property of these Pauli invariance ensembles. But in our case of uh, circuits, we get a nice simple expression for this eigenvalue, which is just this average of this rotated Pauli. And the goal now is to sort of find a nice representation for this. A few properties. Uh, first of all, T lambda does not depend on the whole specifics of the Pauli. It only depends on the support and more, more uh, precisely on the pairwise support. Uh, so you look at each uh, individual Pauli in the tensor product and if they're both the identity you assign a zero, otherwise you assign a one and you get a bit string and the eigenvalue only depends on this bit string. Um, and more importantly, we have a nice probabilistic interpretation for these eigenvalues. Uh, I told you before that it has this expression, this average, but if you stare at this guy inside, inside the average long enough, you realize that since this u is a Clifford, or at least it can be taken to be a Clifford, this u p lambda u dagger is also a Pauli operator. And this is a diagonal element of a Pauli operator which is zero unless it's a string of identities in Z. And, and so this guy inside here is just an indicator function and which lights up if U P lambda U dagger is a Z string and otherwise it's zero. And the uh, average of an indicator function is simply the probability that whatever this function indicates is true. And so we have this nice thing that the, the eigenvalue corresponding to the Pauli operator P lambda is just uh, equal to the probability that we apply a circuit to our Pauli and it spits out uh, a string of identity and Z. And you can do all sorts of sanity checks on this expression and it corresponds to the correct thing in the infinite limit case and in the zero case. And this expression allows to find a nice matrix product state representation. So this uh, is a lot of stuff on a slide, but uh, to, to put it simply, uh, we can, so the goal was to compute this probability that P lambda is mapped to a Z string under a, a Clifford rotation. And if you imagine the N equals two case, so we have a two qubits Pauli as an input here and we apply a Clifford. It's pretty clear that the, whether the, fi the final result is a Z string or not only depends on the initial support of the Pauli because the identity will always be mapped to the identity, of course. And any other Pauli will just be mapped to a random Pauli, which is not the identity, independently of the input. And so given a Pauli string with uh, input uh, x1, x2, uh, we want to know the probability that the output Pauli has a support y1, y2. And once we have gone from the first to the second layer, we can feed this probability in the next layer and so on. And so this blue section given some input will give you the probability with an assignment of zeros and one on this lens, will give you the probability that the output Pauli has the support corresponding to this bit string. And then we can apply this vector, which tells you that the probability of a Pauli with a given support is a that string. So if the output is a, 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 Pauli, a, a Pauli with support on both qubits, they, either qubit could be either X, Y, or Z, so it's one third per qubit, this probability will be one, one over nine, for example. 
And from the same contraction technique as earlier, we get an MPS representation for, the, uh, for these eigenvalues. So for, for, uh, so for the eigenvalues, we can find an MPS where we can efficiently compute the, uh, the, the eigenvalue of each Pauli. And again, the bond dimension is the same as before. It's 2 to the d minus 1. And so it's polynomial uh, in the distance. Um, sorry, I got confused. What do you mean by MPS representation of eigenvalues? Uh... Yes. So um, there, is a, there is one eigenvalue for each bit string lambda. So you can, you can picture this as a huge vector indicized by lambda. And uh, we can represent this vector as a matrix product state, where each leg is one of the bits in, in lambda. Yeah, so uh, essentially this, this MPS is the measurement channel in its diagonal basis, right? Okay. But we don't really just want to know the, the, the measurement channel. Uh, I, what we really care about is its inverse. And so we want to know given an operator A, how do we apply the inverse operator uh, of this measurement channel to, to, to our observable. There is a very easy case, which is a bit cheating. What if the observable is sparse? And by sparse, I mean that in its Pauli decomposition, there are only polynomially many Paulis which have a non-zero coefficient. And we can we have access to the coefficient. Well, then we can just simply compute T lambda D for each of the lambdas for which a la alpha lambda is not zero. And we get a finite list, which is polynomial in the system size. And we can just compute the inverse. Uh, practical example is uh, local Hamiltonians. We, we can use this to, uh, to, to apply this to local Hamiltonians or even just single Pauli operators. But we don't, we don't really uh, always have this luxury. Otherwise, uh, what we would like to do is to find a matrix product state representation of one over the eigenvalues, which of course is the eigenvalues of the of the inverse uh, operator. Oh, and I forgot to mention, in case anybody is wondering, this t lambda is guaranteed to be strictly positive. So in the in this case, this m is invertible because it is the probability that we map our Pauli to a z string, and you can always find a circuit that does it. Just just pick the first layer to be the right Cliffords to map uh, your Pauli to the z string and then pick all of their others to be the identity. And so you have at least one, so the probability is not zero. So the problem, the general problem here is given a matrix product state that corresponds, each assignment corresponds to a vector element, can we find another matrix product state such that each of its leg assignments correspond to the pointwise inverse of the, of the, of the original MPS? So can we find an, yeah, can we find an MPS for the pointwise inverse of another MPS? And if we manage to do this, this would allow us to compute it, to compute this uh, inverse channel applied to an observable for ob so-called shallow observables, which simply means that the observable is given as a low bound dimension matrix product operator, which is just a matrix product state with, with legs sticking out on both sides, such that it's actually a matrix and, and not a vector. So how do we do this? <clears throat> so the idea is to just define some cost function, which is zero uh, if uh, our inverse is exactly correct and to minimize it. The cost function is just if, uh, oh, sorry, there is a, this, either this should be an X or this should be a Lambda, I apologize. Um, but simply we take the two norm of the pointwise product of the two vectors so M is the vector that we would like to invert and V is our ansatz the two, the, of the pointwise product of these two vectors minus the all one vector. And if V of X is equal to one over M of X, this vanishes. And this cost function can be computed via, uh, efficiently via MPS contractions. And now we need to minimize this. And this is actually uh, something that we came up with in the last few months, so it's not, yet published how we do this right now. There is an older version in the current paper. Um, but here the cost function, of course, is a function of each individual of these tensors, but we can fix everyone except one and see 
what the function that comes out is. And it turns out that a very simple function comes out, a quadratic form, where this a and b are efficiently computable functions of all the other tensors that we pretend are fixed and we don't vary. And this is very, very easy to minimize. So we just minimize it using, I don't know, either least squares or whatever method we want to use. And we find a minimum v11. And this is also a function of all of the other tensors. But this is clearly not enough. So what do we do? We repeat the process. We go to the second tensor and we minimize keeping everything fixed except the second one. Then we go to the third. And when we go to the end, we start from the beginning. And in this, in this particular case, this cost function is nice enough that this process is guaranteed to converge to a minimum of the cost function. Uh, there are drawbacks. So there are important open questions about this inversion algorithm. First of all, a big um, sorry, sorry, I got maybe I got uh, I got a bit so, so is it uh, so how how you uh, guarantee that 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 you converge to the true solution? So is it yeah? Do you put it in framework of, of, of some general optimization problems or? Yeah, yeah, so this is this is actually a known result because this this one this uh, optimization is called cyclic coordinate descent, and there are existing results on the convergence guarantees for this cyclic coordinate descent. Uh, in this case, it converges because it satisfies this uh, property where the the function where you fix all variables except one they are strictly convex, and they admit a unique minimum, and when this is satisfied, uh, it's, the, the algorithm is guaranteed to converge to a stationary point. Okay. Uh, and, and time of convergence? Uh, yeah, that's, that's unknown, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, OK. So it's known to converge at some point, but not you don't know necessarily when, but uh, in practice, it works, probably. Exactly. In practice, we have observed it to work, but we have no guarantees on the speed of convergence uh, because the the cost function is unfortunately globally non-convex, and very little is known about non-convex. This kind of non-convex optimization, as far as I can tell, but I'm not really an expert. Um, and another very important question is: suppose we want to achieve a certain minimum, uh, what is the bond dimension of the inverse that which is necessary to achieve achieve a certain accuracy in the minimum? Of course, an, an, uh, an MPS inverse always exists if you push the bond dimension high enough. But ideally, we would like uh, this bond dimension to stay low. Uh, again, numerically, we have observed that it is possible to find very low bond dimension inverses, even when the bond dimension, like even we can even set the bond dimension of the inverse to be lower than the bond dimension of the actual MPS that we're trying to invert, and it finds very good minimums. But there are, again, we have yet we have no, not yet uh, theoretical guarantees on this. And as I said, the global the the the, the optimization optimizer, sorry, the function that we have to optimize is uh, globally non-convex, and so we cannot guarantee that we will converge to a global minimum. This this now I, it seems like I I, I destroyed our own uh, method, but uh, the nice thing about this is that this inversion must be performed only once for every system size and every depth. So if we fix the number of qubits and we choose some depth, uh, we can find this inverse MPS, and then we never have to do it again for every state and for every observable we're set for life. So even if this even if the speed of convergence turned out to be not very good, it's still a step that you have to only perform once. So we uh, now we have all of the ingredients to run to actually run the protocol. Once we have collected n snapshots. And we store them as matrix product states. We have two possibilities: either the observable that we want to estimate is sparse, for example, it's a local Hamiltonian, or it's even a, a single Pauli. Then we can just estimate the expectation value of individual Paulis in the decomposition, and we just get the result by summing the, summing the expectation values up using the coefficients. And estimating a single Pauli is uh, clearly efficient because um, because we just have to apply this m minus one to the single Pauli, but this is the eigenvalues that we expressed as MPS earlier. And since it's a single one, we can just invert it by, by, by inverting a single number. And this contraction is efficient. And in this case, we don't need to do any of this uh, MPS inversion business. But if the observable we are given is shallow, for example, uh, uh, an example is 
we want to compute the fidelity of an MPS state. Uh, and then the observable is simply the, the, the projector on these states, which is a low bound dimension MPO. Then we actually need to find an MPS representation for this inverse measurement channel. And we can now compute M minus one O using MPS contractions and compute this average efficiently. And um, so now we can run the protocol. And uh, until now, I told you that we restrict the depth to be logarithmic in the system size, and we can run an efficient protocol, but you could maybe come up with many efficient protocols that actually are very bad at estimating any observables. So the final question is, what's the shadow norm? What's, what's the sample efficiency? Um, what observables is this protocol good at estimating? So this was uh, a couple of slides ago. So as a reminder, uh, the sample complexity is controlled by this quantity, the shadow norm. Oh no, I, I actually made a mistake in writing it here. Okay, it's not so important. But uh, if we, if we, so this is actually a very hard quantity to compute and I apologize that, I, that it's written wrong here, I'm sorry. This is actually a, a very hard quantity to compute because it's a third moment of the circuit uh, and we, we tried a lot. Uh, and we can, we can compute it uh, numerically or we can bound it numerically. But another idea is to instead of maximizing overall states, uh, we average of our old states. And now we get the locally scrambled channel norm, which was also introduced in a couple of earlier papers. And this uh, gives you the average sample complexity as opposed to the worst case one. So it's, it doesn't really give you a guarantee. It just tells you that for most states, or like if you pick a state at random with high probability, the sample complexity is going to be good for your observable if this locally scrambled channel norm is good. So do you, do you average over some uh, like families of local quantum circuits of certain depth or just general high random states? Uh... It's enough. It's enough to uh, average over uh, one design because it's a it's the, yeah, the it's linear in states. It's linear mm -hmm. in the state. Yes. Okay. So this this is why it's called locally scrambled because you could locally scramble your state using one qubit unitaries. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it, you can actually average over a very uh, very simple sets of states. You don't need the full hard random uh, or the full unitary group. So for some observable, we can efficiently compute the locally scrambled shadow norm is given by this expression. I know there are a lot of expressions here. I just want to say we can compute this stuff. Uh, this can be computed efficiently. Of course, for, for sparse observables, it's easy. You just sum up all of the coefficients. And for shallow observables, you need an MPS representation for this inverse channel, but you can also compute this efficiently. While the real shadow norm without uh, maximizing over the state, you just ask, what is the sample complexity if I want to estimate my observable and I know what state I have? Uh, it's given by this expression. Uh, and this O tilde is some matrix, the coefficients of which we can compute efficiently. But of course, there could be exponentially many. Uh, the point of this is that the shadow norm can be expressed as the max eigenvalue of some matrix, which we could in principle compute. And we can also we can also compute a bound on this shadow norm, which is computable via MPS contractions. Even though the bound dimension is, is pretty high, but in principle, this is polynomial in the system size. So, uh, this said, uh, we, so we can compute shadow norms. The ideal thing to have is what HKP present, which are general bounds on the shadow norm for any observables. And this would be amazing, and we cannot do it yet. Okay, so before, before I, I talk about this, this is an example. This is the shadow norm of a K local Pauli as a function of the depth. So we can see that at depth zero, it's uh, actually three to the K. So this is simply, I think, Z to the, uh, like z, 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 and how many z there is is k. And we can see that the estimation, the shadow norm actually gets better with the depth at first. So intermediate depths are actually better at estimating local uh, Paulis than uh, the single qubit Cliffords, which uh, at the beginning I found quite surprising. And then of course it becomes bad with depth as expected because uh, 
all these Paulis have uh, Frobenius norm two to the n, and so it should be really bad in the in the high depth limit. And we see that all of these converge to the t equals infinity limit. So, as I was saying, what it would be nice to have is real bounds on the shadow norm. For now, we cannot do it, but we have analytical rigorous bounds on the locally scrambled shadow norm. So. Um, what we have is that for a depth that scales logarithmically in the system size, for any traceless observables, we have that the shadow norm, the locally scrambled shadow norm, is bounded by essentially the Frobenius norm of O plus some uh, polynomially decaying term. So this means that for a typical state, uh, the sample efficiency is exactly the same as for the global Clifford's scheme but with the advantage that we use exponentially fewer gates. We don't really know anything about the uh, worst case complexity, but we know that at least in the D infinity case in the global Clifford setting, the locally scrambled shadow norm is essentially the same as the real shadow norm up to a constant. So we hope that something similar holds for the uh, intermediate case. And uh, hopefully maybe we will have a, a, an actual shadow norm bound someday. And also, uh, if the and also like about uh, so this means that it's also good. It's as good as the global Clifford scheme at estimating low Frobenius norm observables. What about local observables? We have that if an operator O is local on some region of the lattice that is smaller than log n, then the shadow norm is polynomial in the system size. So we have efficient sample efficiency on average at estimating global low probability norm observables and also sample efficiency on average at estimating local observables. And as a note for Pauli operators, the locally scrambled shadow norm is actually the same as the shadow norm. So these are actual uh, performance guarantees for local for single Pauli operators. So to conclude, I, 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 I talked a lot, I think. Uh, we introduced a protocol that at logarithmic, logarithmic depth is easier to implement than the global Clifford schemes at the cost of harder classical post-processing, but the classical post-processing is not the hard part, of course. For an average state, it has the same performance as the global Clifford scheme, and it is able to also efficiently estimate local observables. And it is computationally efficient up to these open questions on the inversion of the measurement channel. And as I said, there are like the Two like uh, big open questions, I would say, are to get rigorous bounds on the actual shadow norm, not the locally scrambled one, to get a worst case performance guarantee, and rigorous bounds on the efficiency of this inversion algorithm or uh, other ways to invert this measurement channel. And that's it for me. I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Um, uh, thanks, Christian, for, for the great talk. Uh, yeah, we have time for questions and comments to the speaker. So just unmute yourself if you're interested and ask. Hi, can I have a question? Sure. Please, Sasha. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was kind of intrigued by uh, the minimization that you said you haven't published yet. Could you? Say a bit more about uh, because I already forgot what the function was. Uh, so anything you could say about that would be interesting. So uh, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was the slide before. This one. Uh, no, no. I mean, um, I think it was that slide. And could you maybe sketch out what kind of method do you use to simplify this? Minimization. So this, uh, okay, it's clear what the cost function is. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. Uh, to to simply, so the the key is that the easy minimization is that okay. Suppose we knew the uh, we knew the answer. We some some genie gives us the the correct inverse MPS, the blue MPS, but it doesn't tell tell us one of the tensors that the genie keeps them that to themselves. And we have to find out one of the tensors. Uh, what we do then is that we we uh, we just consider this cost function as a function of the single tensor that is missing. And if mm -hmm. we turn it down, we're gonna get this expression here. So this is a function of all of the other tensors that we already know. And yeah. 
uh, and this is just a simple quadratic form in the single tensors that we don't know. And this is really easy to uh, to uh, to optimize. This is essentially a parabola in uh, in uh, the dimension that corresponds to the size of this matrix. And this vector here is simply the vectorization of the of the matrix that gives this tensor v one. And okay. uh, once we can do this, we can pretend that the old tensors except one are already the right solution and do the, this minimization. And we do it and we repeat this process iteratively for each tensor. And this, the cost function will decrease at each step. Uh, it will get better and better and better. And as I said, it will, it will converge to, to some minimum eventually. In the infinite steps limit, you, you will get to a minimum. Of course, you would like to get to a minimum in few steps, but uh, the convergence seems good numerically. I don't have any plots, unfortunately, in this, in this talk but uh, we don't have guarantees on that. Sure, thank you. Um, any more questions or comments? Okay, I, I have one, one question. So as far as uh, shadow norm is concerned, uh, I. Like if I do I understand well that because this is a Pauli channel, you can actually just analytically probably compute shadow norm uh, well, or like you can bound quite efficiently at the uh, like this variance for estimation of individual Paulis. Yes, yeah, like, actually I haven't yeah, read it. Given in terms of those, uh, maybe you wrote it. Even though. No, I haven't actually wrote it down, but I think from here, if O was a single Pauli, the shadow norm is simply one or the eigenvalue. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so I wonder, just quite, okay, sort of in practice, many observables are sort of given, like, I mean, often one is interested in estimating Paulis after all. So uh, did, you, did you play sort of, because, you know, on lo local shadows, they have, I guess for Paulis it's not four to the k, but three to the k, right? Uh, the sample complexity for local for lo local Clifford for local Clif for shadows based on local Cliffords. So did you play I don't know numerically how it sort of behaves for I don't know lo uh, local pa ah this is exactly for Paulis I see yeah this is for Paulis for local Paulis is the blue curve uh, uh, so this is the most local Pauli which matters I see. So it seems that that, that uh, wait, do I have, give me a second. So this D, so you start with local, uh, so the, the, the D equal to zero amounts to just local shadows, uh, yes. right? So then it so happens that it seems that just depth one is best uh, for them. Well, is it best? No, no, it's not. It depends on locality. Uh, sure, okay. So, so this this d equal to one. It, I guess uh, I just wanted to connect the dots. So there was a paper by by Martin Klisch and in, uh, Ingo Ruf and maybe somebody else, but those two guys that they actually maybe analytically studied uh, something like this, right? So, so I just want to to is it the, is it the, is it is this the region when you guys sort of overlap basically or. Uh, so oh, in the paper you studied maybe depth two or something like this. Uh, uh, yes, in in the paper that you're referring to, I, I believe I know what, what, what paper you're talking about. They they explicitly explicitly analytically compute this exactly. this t lambda mm -hmm. uh, for depth two. Okay, I right, see. and, and so course, yes, mm -hmm. and this also well since this t lambda corresponds to the shadow norm, this also implies uh, guarantees on the on the Pauli estimation. Uh, wow. sample, sample efficiency, yeah. So yeah, for D equals two, there are now uh, exact analytical results. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, we can also compute exactly the, the T lambdas, like these eigenvalues, we can also compute them exactly by an MPS representation as opposed to, sure. but, but they can write, like this is an extremely yeah, impressive. You can, you can, they can uh, write you can an actual MPS representation to like, I throw in any power that I care about and then you, you give them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, nice. 
And do, do, you, uh, do you guys uh, have a code uh, sort of available on uh, like publicly of, of this? Uh, I'm just wondering. Like, not, not yet, but we will, because as I said, this inversion thing is not yet, well, I don't know where it is, but this inversion thing is not yet published, but as soon as we publish that, we're going to publish the code for it in, uh, cool. with it. So uh, yeah, and also I, I think uh, we will include some code to to uh, actually compute shadows and, and, and compute estimation value, expectation values and, and, and things like this. So code is coming hopefully. Cool. Just, okay, one thing just comes to my, like, uh, the, like, did you, because you, you, you showed how it looks for local observables, right? Uh, but uh, how uh, as, how variance behaves for local observables, for local policies, but do you have some examples for, uh, say, for fidelity estimation? Like, um, I don't have examples yet for the shadow norm, uh, yeah. and I don't, I don't have, we're doing it in now. And uh, for the actual uh, estimation, there are plots in the paper, okay. uh, but I did not include them in this presentation, of course, but in the paper as well, not of course, sorry, I, I did not <laughs> include them, unfortunately. Uh, no, but, it's not a problem, I'm just, you know, I'm just interested. That's yeah, yeah, no, but in the paper we have, we have some examples of actually estimating fidelities using uh, low depth circuits like with stabilizer states or something yeah yeah we used uh, uh i think a ghz states and some variations okay thanks christian we are maybe about to wrap up so last chance to ask something to, to christian if you guys are or to yeah or to marcel or marius who are quarters and are visiting actually worse in person yeah i guess you can you can chat with them if you have any yeah. any blackboard questions the last three hours of them in the office or something okay <laughs> okay if there are no further questions let's thank the speaker again thanks christian see you around thank you thanks a lot bye-bye